Welcome back to the fifth and final video lecture on chapter 49, Hazardous Materials. In this uh, video, we're going to talk about decontamination. All right, and when you're talking about decontamination, there's many different methods. The methods will depend on the type of hazmat involved, the stability of the scene, the number, condition, and location of patients. You're going to want to consider the protection of the environment while decontaminating. If it's some sort of liquid uh, decontamination that you're performing, you're going to have some downstream runoff, right? Um, make sure that this uh, doesn't necessarily go out and contaminate the environment. You want to have some sort of plan to contain that runoff. It's secondary when lives are at risk. You have four main types of decontamination methods. Dilution, absorption, neutralization, and disposal. I've heard before uh, a common phrase, the solution to pollution is dilution. We use that in paramedicine uh, when we sort of assume that somebody has been, you know, had some sort of ingestion poisoning or overdose and we want to dilute them with fluids, so on and so forth. Uh, but but it is a you know a good phrase in a sense because dilution is a form of decontamination. It's the most common method and the easiest to perform. It relies on copious amounts of water to flush the containment from the skin or the eyes. Solvents uh, are difficult to remove using only water, and the patient may have a solvent odor for a while after decontamination. Absorption. Uh, Accomplished with large pads that soak up liquid and remove it from the patient. Towels can be used in this way. Neutralization. This involves a chemical to change the hazmat into a less harmful substance. So you're going to cause a transformation. Uh, rarely used when a person has had contact with a hazardous material substance because of the dangers of uncontrolled exothermic reactions. Uh, disposal, more of a result of the decontamination process than an actual decontamination process, but it is used to remove as much of the patient's clothing as possible in order to reduce the amount of contamination that contacts the body. Simply removing the clothing can reduce the level of contamination by as much of, as 80 to 90 percent. 80 to 90 percent reduction in con contamination just by removing the clothing on somebody. And that would be disposal. <clears throat> In some cases, you may need to make an immediate decision to treat patients despite contamination. Use appropriate PPE in th those situations. Emergency decontamination is the process of removing the bulk of con uh, contaminants from a person as quickly and completely as possible. You're going to instruct the person to disrobe and remove as much of the hazmat from the body as possible. Remember, 80 to 90% of it. Uh, give the person bags to put personal belongings and clothing into. Brush off any powder. Uh, water from any visible or from any available source, rather, uh, is most often the universal decontamination solution. Remember, the solution to pollution is dilution, and you might want to use water. If the substance is water reactive, do not use water to decontaminate. You're going to have a decontamination corridor. Uh, firefighters can set up hose streams to perform this mass decontamination. Uh, the corridor can be set up in the warm zone by parking two fire engines parallel to each other, approximately 10 to 20 feet apart. Nozzles can be attached to the side discharge ports and set to create a fine particle fog stream, uh, which will provide a decontamination shower, so to speak. And so people can go be taken through that corridor uh, before they're brought into the cold zone. Patients uh, disrobe on one end, they enter the shower in a single file line and make it through. Rem remember to be cautious for hypothermia in certain environments. Technical decontamination is the thorough cleaning process used by responders to clean PPE tools and equipment using cleaning solutions, scrub brushes, and decontam uh, a decontamination corridor. This process can differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but the scrub brushes and the soap thing is, is kind of universal. You see that almost everywhere. Uh, the process is pr you know, pretty uh, thorough, but also pretty simple. I mean, you're gonna 
drench somebody in water and then you're going to scrub them down and then you're going to dilute it again with more water uh, get rid of all the soap and everything and then they're going to disrobe as they move out into the cold zone so that's the biggest thing with decontamination is not letting anybody uh, out into the non-contaminated area before they're deconned unless it's an emergency decontamination. Uh, treatment of patients exposed to hazardous materials. Uh, invasive procedures should be minimized if possible. Okay, uh, Endotracheal intubation may expose a patient to airway contamination. Placement of an IV or an IO may allow contamination to bypass the skin barrier. Remember, you have an intact skin and now you're sticking something through it you could bring in that contaminant when you go to do that procedure. Uh, weigh the risks against the benefits. So does the person need that ET tube? Do they need that IV or IO? Familiar yourself with uh, reference and how to access technical expertise when deciding how to treat these patients. Assistance may be obtained from the ERG or ChemTrack as I've discussed before. Consult with agencies such as poison control centers. Uh, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, or Local Medical Control. You are the eyes and the ears of the physician in the field. Share the knowledge you have gained from the hazardous material team, uh, from the hazardous materials, you know, to the team. <clears throat> Corrosives are acids and bases. They're not just, you know, they can have a pH on either end of the spectrum. Corrosives are chemicals. They include both acids and the bases, the toilet bowl cleaner, uh, lye, uh, hyd hydrochloric acid. Obviously, that one is an acid. They can cause severe burns to the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes. Signs and symptoms include skin, skin irritation, reddening or other discoloration, blistering, burns. They include severe life-threatening airway and even lung burns. Uh, once the patient is decontaminated, treatment is supportive. Ensure a patient or the patient has a patent airway, oxygenate that patient, treat for pain if indicated, treat burns appropriately, consider transport to a burn center if needed. Always consult medical control to determine the proper course of action when treating patients with chemical exposures. Next up we have solvents. Solvents can be liquids, solids, or gases. Uh, they include paint thinner or nail polish remover. They're capable of dissolving other substances. They may give off a, uh, potent vapors that can be inhaled or absorbed through the skin. Usually they're very pungent, that you could smell them. Uh, they can cause immediate pulmonary symptoms such as pulmonary edema. Prolonged dermal exposure can cause symptoms as well. Uh, although most of it is inhalation, if there's a lot of skin exposure, you can have some symptoms like cardiac, and you can even have uh, cardiac arrhythmias and seizures. Exposures may require extensive decontamination. So solvents may require extensive decontamination. Also, solvents can be metabolized into other toxic substances once absorbed by the body. Pay special attention to the potential for vomiting. This may complicate the patient's airway and be a cause for chemical pneumonia. Pesticides. They can cause runaway nervous system stimulation. Use the mnemonic dumbbells or sludge them uh, for pesticides. A dumbbell stands for diarrhea, urination, meiosis, or muscle weakness, bradycardia, bronchospasm, bronchorrhea, emesis, lacrimation, uh, seizures, salivation, sweating. Also, the, the sludge mnemonic included salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, uh, gastric uh, issues, uh, I'm trying to think, emesis, and meiosis. I might have skipped defecation. That's also on there. So it's pretty much somebody that's just having this parasympathetic overload of just everything is coming out of everywhere, right? And we know the treatment is an anticholinergic such as atropine. Exposures can uh, also produce tachycardia or bradycardia, twitching muscles, excessive pulmonary secretion. So that's pesticides. Also, your treatment uh, includes aggressive decontamination. It could include intubation. Frequent airway suctioning is necessary. 
because remember every you know you're having a lot of secretions a lot of vomit all right you might want to intubate provide high flow oxygen and ventilation I already spoke about atropine and prolidoxime as recommended as you give atropine you create acetylcholinesterase and you have to uh, give the prolidoxime to eliminate that acetylcholinesterase chemical asphyxiants or asphyxiants excuse me uh, chemical asphyxiant interfere with the use of oxygen at the cellular level so it's stopping cellular respiration that's what a chemical asphyxiant does. Uh, it's an asphyxiant is any gas that displaces oxygen uh, from the atmosphere. Cyanide is a common example. Treatment for cyanide exposure, uh, patients should inhale amyl nitrate ampules for 15 seconds of every minute, follow with IV administration of 3 milligrams of sodium nitrite or nitrate, uh, followed by 12.5 grams of sodium uh, thiosulfate. This is in the cyano kits. They, they create kits now that the fire departments carry. Uh, you're going to follow the instructions found in this uh, cyanide antidote kit for definitive treatment. So cyanide can do the same thing as carbon monoxide in a way. It's got a, a great affinity to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is what carries oxygen and it's a chemical asphyxiant in the sense that if your hemoglobin is carrying cyanide instead of oxygen, then you're not going to have cellular metabolism or cellular respiration where oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide, right? Um, and you're going to end up uh, potentially hypoxic because of the chemical asphyxiation. <clears throat> so your hydrocobalamin, your cyano kit, as I spoke about before, uh, is your treatment for uh, smoke inhalation cyanide poisoning. Carbon monoxide... I just mentioned is another common cause of chemical association because it's uh, got such a great affinity for hemoglobin. You want to consider transport to an ED with a hyperbaric chamber for carbon monoxide poisoning because hyperbaric chambers can actually push oxygen onto the hemoglobin. That's kind of how you want to picture it. Uh, the, the pressure within the, the uh, hyperbaric chamber because it's kind of like diving or going high up into the atmosphere like you're going up a mountain the oxygen concentration changes and your the affinity to the hemoglobin will change as you go in that hyperbaric chamber and get dived to a certain atmospheric pressure toxic products of combustion are the hazardous chemical compounds released when a material decomposes under heat toxic gases are liberated during a resident residential structure fire uh, remember the phrase, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, burning wood gives off more than 70 harmful chemical compounds. 70 harmful chemical compounds just from burning wood. Now think of all of the other stuff in a potential structure fire, like vinyl, plastics, all of that stuff that you could be breathing in. Here's some other toxic substances found in smoke from fire. Soot, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water vapor formaldehyde, cyanide, compounds, many oxides of nitrogen. Uh, carbon monoxide affects the ability for human body to transport oxygen. We talked about the chemical asphyxiation. Cyanide compounds affect oxygen uptake in the body. Again, causing chemical asphyxiation. Formaldehyde causes eye and lung irritation. Oxides of nit nitrogen are deep lung irritants that can cause pulmonary edema and fluid buildup in the lungs, which again will cause asphyxiation. So not a good day to be exposed by all of those things transportation considerations it is ideal to have paramedics who are not involved with decontamination or cold zone patient treatment standing by the transport patients to the ed this really eliminates the possibility of cross-contamination or secondary contamination do not assume that patients received after the field decontamination are completely decontaminated Wear appropriate PPE if indica indicated, which is always indicated, right? And be trained to wear the level required. Receive a complete report from the hazardous materials team, including what the hazmat was, the patient's source of exposure, and what has been done to decontaminate and treat them. You should never transport a patient if there hasn't been sufficient decontamination. And don't be alarmed when you get to the hospital if they decide that they're going to do another decontamination when you get there. 
because that is very common. They really don't want to contaminate an emergency room. Before transporting patients, you can prepare in several ways. Reduce the amount of supplies and equipment that the patient will contact. Use as much disposable equipment as possible. Supplies and equipment inside the ambulance should be removed and set aside in a clean, safe place to be retrieved later. That is a possibility. Uh, plan to wrap the patient in a plastic barrier to reduce the potential for secondary contamination. That's if you have a severe hazmat, severe contamination. A double wrap procedure is preferable. Uh, the patient first wrapped in a plastic blanket and then the patient is placed in, on a backboard and then a stretcher. So you have lots of barriers in between the patient and all of your equipment. You're going to give the emergency department plenty of notice prior to transport so it can get properly trained personnel together and prepare their equipment. And again, they might do a whole other decon. Uh, medical monitoring and rehabilitation. You may be asked to assist with medical monitoring and of the hazmat team. PPE often causes heat stress and the toxins the team is working with can cause serious health effects. So be ready to treat the team. Factors that influence the hazardous material team members include physical fitness, activity, the level of PPE being worn, environmental factors like temperature. Um, if you've never been in a hazmat suit, like a level B or a le or level A suit, uh, you really haven't experienced the amount of uh, heat and sweat that they can produce in a short amount of time. And then you add working a, a rigorous scene to that and these uh, responders can become patients rather quickly. So be ready to treat them. Medical monitoring includes documentation of the incident factors, which is the hazmat involved, toxic effects, PPE worn, the PPE's resistance to permeability with hazardous materials, the type of decontamination that was used, have a plan for treatment transport, and the potential availability of antidotes. Assess the hazardous materials team before they enter and after they leave the hot zone. Assessment should include complete set of vital signs, EKG, temperature, body weight, the team, team members should pre-hydrate with water or sports drink, like a 50-50 Gatorade water uh, is probably perfect for situations like that. Before they re-enter the hot zone, they should be evaluated again, hydration status, vital signs, any symptoms for potential exposure to the toxic agent. Team members should remove their protective clothing uh, and be given time to rest, so uh, strip them down, you know, to something appropriate and give them time to rest in an air conditioned area. Reassess vital signs, perform a neurologic assessment following that. And then members with high temperatures should be monitored for heat stroke. Remember, we want to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Loss of body weight uh, correlates to the loss of fluids and the risk of dehydration and hypovolemia. So again, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Anyone with abnormal vital signs shouldn't be allowed back to work until his or her, her physical status is back to normal. Just like working a structure fire, if you're doing rehab at a structure fire, you have certain vital signs parameters that a firefighter who's been working a fire has to fall under before they're allowed to go back to work that fire. So um, that's very important information. Always be ready to treat responders as well as uh, other hazmat victims. And that is it for the five videos on the hazmat uh, chapter. Please go through the rest of the module and complete those videos and quizzes.